we began to call General Washington, His Excellency, from very early on in the war. Uh, when I first met His Excellency, I was a captain of artillery in New York, and we didn't go to war. The war came to us. Uh, the Redcoats came. We built earthworks all around uh, York Island or Manhattan Island, I think, in your day. And in terms of how the battles worked in and around New York, well, they worked out brilliantly if you were in the British Army and the Continental Army, not too well at all. It was an entirely indefensible position. Uh, General Washington had our troops building earthworks around York Island, but they didn't land at York Island, they landed on Staten Island. And then instead of coming directly across, they outflanked us by striking at Brooklyn. Well, this forced General Washington to a decision. He could uh, choose to divide his forces, which he was very loath to do. We were already outnumbered. Or he could give up the entirety of Long Island, something he was also very loath to do. But he made a decision to not give up Long Island without a fight. So he divided his forces, sent troops to Brooklyn. General Howe was able to get troops up around our men and pushed our men back up on Brooklyn Heights and stood poised to annihilate our forces there. Uh, General Howe, uh, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, had uh, fought uh, actions at night previously and it hadn't worked out rather well. So he said, we'll finish them off in the morning. Well, General Washington, was able to ferry 9,000 men over the East River under cover of darkness without alerting a redcoat sentry. No mean feat, I can tell you. Leaving those men free to fight another day. Of course, ultimately, they did cross to York Island. They forced us to retreat. We retreated the length of New Jersey. Uh, now, retreating is a dismal business at best, but there is no more dismal place to retreat through than New Jersey. We retreated across New Jersey into Pennsylvania. On December 25th of that year, we recrossed the Delaware and surprised Colonel Rawl at his Hessians at Trenton. Now, a few days later, General Lord Cornwallis sought to entrap us in uh, Trenton, and uh, uh, they came after us, our men retreating across the bridge, the single bridge across the river there, and the last man across that bridge was General Washington. General Washington, in those days, had two horses. Well, he has quite a few horses, actually, but uh, his favorites are Nelson, given to him by Governor Nelson, and Old Blue. And in those days, he would stand with Blue as the men passed in front. As the files passed him, the men would reach out and touch Old Blue as a sign of respect. Something horses don't normally bear, but I think Old Blue knew that this was a mark of respect for his master. When General Washington held the army together in those darkest days, then before Trenton, then after Trenton, at Valley Forge, at Morristown, and in very dark days, he prevented the mutiny at Newburgh. This is the sort of citizen soldier that General Washington showed us an example of. Now, years later, our government, under the Articles of Confederation, is a completely inefficacious government. James Madison and I enjoined General Washington to come north to Philadelphia to create the Constitution. Uh, General Washington was so famous in those days that uh, he lent an authority to the convention in Philadelphia by his mere presence. You see, we actually hadn't been sent to Philadelphia to create a new government, but only to amend the Articles of Confederation. I'm very often asked my opinion of the Constitution, and I will tell you, I never expect to see perfect work from imperfect man. And there wasn't a man, Jack of us, who was completely satisfied when the document, when we left that September day of 1787. But we all knew we could trust the man who would become our first chief magistrate or president, because that man would be General Washington. Now, our fledgling federal government in those days faced serious danger. Talk of secession was rife both in the North and the South. Uh, tensions over a weakened economy and uh, uh, the permanent placement of the capital was dividing the nation. In those days, I encountered Jefferson. And Jefferson and I disagree on almost everything you can imagine. Save one thing. We both knew 
General Washington must serve a second term as president of this, these United States to keep this nation together. During the war, uh, General Washington asked me to become one of his aide-de-camp. An aide-de-camp is a sort of military secretary, if you will. Uh, uh, the duties of an aide-de-camp are many and varied. They in include the interrogation of spies, very infrequently ac acting in the general's name. But more often than not, it is the day-to-day -day administration of the army. General Washington made me a member of his staff. In those days, when he had a, an important decision to make, he would call a council of war and he would let all the men of rank speak as to their opinions and then he would decide during my time as a minister in uh, what is sometimes called the cabinet of general washington he would bring us all together he would ask all of our opinions and then he would reflect upon it and then he would make his decision he consulted much he pondered well he considered well considered carefully and then decided wisely. General Washington is such an extraordinary soldier that when he did leave office, he again returned when we were at war with France, shaking off uh, the dust of his country estate and returning to service yet again. The most extraordinary thing about General Washington is this. He has surprised Europe on so many occasions when he was commander-in-chief of the army, he surrendered that army at the end of the war to the civilian authority. Years later, he is president of these United States. Not only does he not want to serve a second term, but then he serves that term and he steps away from it. Something unimaginable to most Europeans. Then called to service again, he steps to and joins us here. I think there is no man in these United States who has more cause to lament the passing of His Excellency General Washington than myself. He was an aegis to me, a shield to protect me. You know, when I was an aide de camp to General Washington, uh, it became my job to help him feed and clothe the army. When I was made Secretary of the Treasury, it became my job to help him administer to the government and hold this country together. It is Demosthenes that says, and I think it applies to General Washington, as a general marches at the head of his troops, so ought a politician, if I may use the term, to march at the head of affairs, insomuch that they ought not wait the event to decide what measures ought to be taken, but the measures they have taken ought to produce the event. You know, it has frequently been remarked that it seems to be reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are capable or not of establishing good government from. Are we fit no more for the reign and the spur or can we indeed govern ourselves? General Washington has given us a clear example. We have fought side by side to make America free. Let us struggle hand in hand to make her happy as well.